All right. Back, and with a little less pain this time, let's put wax over the savvy parts of my braces. Okay. <coughs> okay, I'm on page 650, Caring for the Consumer. I'm going to read to the end, I think. Okay. See, I'm taking a... I'll just put in my mouth. Okay, caring for the consumer. Roosevelt backed a noteworthy measure in 1906 that benefited both corporations and consumers. Big meat packers were being shut out of certain European markets because some American meat from the small packing houses claimed the giants had been found to be taint tainted. Foreign governments were even threatening to ban all American meat imports by throwing out the good beef with the bad botulism. At the same time, American consumers hungered for safer canned products. Their appetite for reform was whetted by, the, by Upton Sinclair's sensational novel The Jungle, published in 1906. Sinclair, a dedicated socialist... <laughs> Yeah, spin it out. Sorry. Sinclair, a dedicated socialist, intended his revolting tract to focus attention on the plight of workers in the big canning ca factories, but instead he appalled the public with his description of disgustingly unsanitary food products. As he put it, he aimed for the nation's heart, but it hit his stomach. The book described in noxious detail the filth, disease, and putrefaction in Chicago's damp, ill ventilated slaughterhouses. Many readers, including Roosevelt, were so sick in that for a harm. Ah. For a time, they found meat unpalatable. Sorry, I'm like, me. Mm. The president was moved by the loathsome message that I was going to be appointed a special investigating commission, whose cold blooded report almost outdid Sinclair's novel. It related how piles of poisoned rats, rope ends, splinters, and other debris were scooped up and canned as potted ham. A cynical jingle of the time ran. Mary had a little lamb, and when she saw it sicken, she hooked it off to Packing Town, and now it's labeled chicken. Packed by nauseated public Roosevelt induced Congress to pass the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. It decreed that the preparation of meat shipped over the state lines would be subject to federal inspection from coral to can. Although the largest package resisted certain features of the act, they accepted it as an opportunity to drive their smaller fly-by-night competitors out of business. At the same time, they could receive the government's seal of approval on their exports. As a companion to the Meat Inspection Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 was designed to prevent the adulteration and mislabeling of foods and pharmaceuticals. Earth Control Grateful Americans, assuming that their natural resources were inexhaustible, had looted and polluted their incomparable domain with unparalleled speed and greed. Western ranchers and timbermen were especially eager to accelerate the destructive process, for they panted to build up the country, and the environmental consequences be hanged. But even before the end of the 19th century, farmers and leaders saw that the squandering of the nation's birthright would have to be halted, or America would sink from resource riches to despoiled dearth. The first feeble step towards conservation had been taken with the Desert, Desert Land Act of 1877, under which the federal government sold arid land cheaply on the condition that the purchase irrigate, purchase irrigate the thirsty soil within three years. More successful was the Forest Reserve Act of 1891, authorizing the president to set aside public forests as national parks and other reserves. Under the statute, some 46 million acres of magnificent trees were rescued from the lumberman's saw in the 1890s and preserved for posterity. The Cary Act of 1894 distributed federal land to the states on the condition that it be irrigated and settled. A new day in the history of conservation dawned with Roosevelt. Huntsman, naturalist, rancher, lover of the great outdoors, he was appalled by the pillaging of timber and mineral, mineral resources. Other dedicated conservationists, notably Gifford Pinot, Pino, head of the federal... Ah! Head of the federal... Division of Forestry had broken important ground before him, but Roosevelt seed the banner of leadership and charged into the fray with all the weight of his prestige, his energy, his first-hand knowledge, and his slashing and vexes. The first of the desert still unslaked, Congress responded to the lip of the Rough Rider by passing the Landmark Newlands Act of 1902. Washington was authorized to collect money from the sale of the Republic lands in the sun-baked western states and then use these funds for the development of irrigation projects. Settlers repaid the cost of reclamation from their now productive soil, and the money was put into the revolution re revolving fund to finance more such enterprises. The giant Roosevelt Dam, constructed on Arizona Salt River, was appropriately dedicated by Roosevelt in 1911. Thanks to this epochal legislation, dozens of dams were thrown across the virtually every major western river in the ensuing decades. Roosevelt pined to preserve the nation's shrinking forests. By 1900, only about a quarter of the once vast virgin timberlands remained standing. Lumbermen had already logged off most of the first growth timber from Maine to Michigan, and the sharp set of their axes was beginning to split the silence in the great fir forests of the Pacific Slope. Roosevelt proceeded to set aside in Federal Reserve some 125 million acres of almost three times the acreage thus saved from the saw by his three predecessors. He similarly marked, er, earmarked millions of acres of coal deposits, as well as water resources useful for irrigation and power. To set a shining example, in 1902, he banned Christmas trees from the White House. Conservation, including reclamation, may have been Roosevelt's most enduring tangible achievement. He was buoyed into this effort by an upwelling national mood concerned about the disappearance of the frontier, believed to be the source of such national characteristics as individualism and democracy. An increasingly certified people worried that too much civilization might not be good for the national soil. 
Ma National Soul, City Dwellers, Snout Dub, Jack London's Call of the Wild, and other books about nature, and Urban Youngsters made the outdoor-oriented Boy Scouts of America the country's largest youth organization. Middle-class club women raised money for nature preserves and organized the Massachusetts, and later National, Audubon Society to save wild native birds by banning the use of plumes to ornament fashionable ladies' hats. The Sierra Club, founded in 1892, dedicated itself to preserving the wildness of the western landscape. The Preservationists lost a major battle in 1913 when the federal government allowed the city of San Francisco to build a dam for its municipal water supply in the spectacular high-walled Hetch Hetchy Valley in Yosemite National Park. The Hetch Hetchy controversy laid bare a deep division between the conservationists that persists to the present day. To the preservationists of the, preservationists of the Sierra Club, including famed naturalist John Muir, 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 Muir Hetch Hetchy was a temple of nature that should be held inviolable by civilizing the hand of humanity. But other conservationists, among them President Roosevelt's chief forester Gifford Gifford Pinot, believed that the wilderness was waste. Pinot and what you result? Oh my God, Harry! Pinot and Roosevelt wanted to use the nation's natural endowment intelligently. In their eyes, they had to battle on two fronts: against greedy commercial interests that abuse nature, as well as against romantic preservationists and the thrall to simple woodmen swear that that tree, woodmen swear that tree sentimental, sentimentality. Under Roosevelt, professional forager, foresters and engineers developed a policy of multiple-use resource management. They sought to combine recreation, sustained yield locking, watershed protection, and summer stock grazing on the same expanse of federal land. At first, many Westerners resisted the federal management of natural resources, but they soon learned how to take advantage of new agencies like the Forest Service and especially the Bureau of Reclamation. The largest ranchers and timber companies in particular figured out how to work hand in glove with federal conservation programs devoted to rational, large scale, and long term use of natural resources. The one man and a mule logger, or the one man and a dog sheep herders, had little clout on new resources bureaucracy. Single person enterprises were shouldered aside in the interest of efficiency by the combined bulk of big business and big government. <sighs> the Roosevelt Panic of 1907. Oh, shoot, there's so much text on the next page. Roosevelt was handily elected president in his own right in 1904 and entered his new term buoyed by his enormous personal popularity. The cuddly teddy bear honored one of his bear hunting exploits when he saved the life of a cub and children typed vigorously on whistles modeled on his famous teeth. Did the conservative Republican bosses considered him as dangerous and unpredictable as a rattlesnake. They grew increasingly arrested as Roosevelt in his second term called ever more loudly for regulating corporations, taxing incomes, and protecting workers. Roosevelt, meanwhile, had partly defanged himself after his election in 1904 by announcing that under no circumstances would he be a candidate for a third term. This was a tactical blunder, for the power of the king wanes when the people know he will be dead in four years. Roosevelt suffered a sharp setback in 1907 when a short but punishing panic descended on Wall Street. The financial flurry featured frightened runs on banks, suicides, and criminal indictments against speculators. The financial world hastened to blame Roosevelt after the storm. It cried that this quack had unsettled industry with his boat-rocking tactics. Conservatives damned him as Theodore the Meddler and branded the current distress as the Roosevelt Panic. The hot-tempered president angrily lashed back at his critics when he accused certain malefactors of great wealth of having deliberately engineered the monetary crisis to force the government to relax its assault on trust. Fortunately, the Panic of 1907 paved the way for long overdue monetary reforms. Precipitating a currency shortage, the flurry, the flurry laid bare the need for more elastic medium of exchange. In a crisis of this sort, the, sort, the hard-pressed banks were unable to increase the volume of money in circulation, and those with ample re reserves were reluctant to lend their less fortunate competitors. Led to their less fortunate competitors. Congress in 1908 responded by passing the Honored Reland Act, which authorized national banks to issue emergency currency backed by various kinds of collateral. The past was thus smooth for the momentous Federal Reserve Act of 1913. New page. New page. The Rough, the rough Rider thunders out. Still warmly popular in 1908, Roosevelt could easily have won a second presidential nomination and almost certainly the election, but he felt bind by his impulsive post-election promise after his victory in 1904. The departing president thus naturally sought a successor who would carry out my policies. The man of his choice was amiable, ample girthed, and huge frame to William Howard Taft. Secretary of War and mild progressive. As an heir apparent, he had often been called upon in Roosevelt's absence to sit on the lid, all 350 pounds of him. At the Republican Convention of 1908 in Chicago, Roosevelt used his control of the party machinery, the steamroller, to push through the Taft's nomination on the first ballot. Three weeks later, the Mile High Denver, in the heart of the civil country, silver country, the Democrats nominated twice beaten William Jennings Bryan. The Dole campaign of 1908 featured the rotund Taft and now balding boy orator both trying to don the progressive Roosevelt mantle. The solid judge Taft read cut and dried speeches while Bryan griped that Roosevelt had stolen his policies from the Bryanite camp. A majority of voters chose stability with Roosevelt endorsed Taft, who pulled 321 electoral votes to 162 for Bryan. The victor's popular count was 7 million to 6 million. The election's only surprise came from the Socialists, who amassed the 420k votes for Eugene V. Debs, the hero of the Pullman strike of 1894. 
Roosevelt, ever in the limelight, left soon after the election for a lion hunt in Africa. His numerous enemies clinked glasses while toasting House of the Lions, and a few irre irreverently prayed that some big cat would do its duty. But T.R. survived, still bursting with energy at the age of 51 in 1909. Roosevelt was branded by his adversaries as a wild-eyed radical, but his reputation as an eater of Aryan industrialists now seems inflated. He fought many a sham battle, and the number of laws he inspired was certainly not in proportion to the amount of noise he emitted. He was often under attack from the reigning business lords, but the more enlightened of them knew that he, they had a friend in the White House. Roosevelt should be remembered first and foremost as a cowboy who started the tame bucking bronco adolescent capitalism, thus ensuring a long adult life. T.R.'s enthusiasm and perpetual usefulness, like an overgrown Boy Scouts, appeal to the young of all ages. You must always remember, a British diplomat cautioned his colleagues, that the president is about six. He served as a political lighting ro lightning rod to protect capitalists against popular indignation and against socialism, which Roosevelt regarded as ominous. He strenuously sought the middle road between the unbridled individualism and the paternalistic collectivism. His conservative... His conservation crusade, which tried to mediate between the romantic wilderness preservationists and the rap rapacious resource predators, <gasps> excuse me, hmm. was probably his most typical and his most lasting achievement. Several other contributions of Roosevelt lasted beyond his presidency. First, he greatly enlarged the power and prestige of the presidential office, and masterfully developed the technique of using big stick and publicity as a political bludgeon. Second, he helped shape the progressive movement and beyond it the liberal reform campaigns later in the century. His square deal, in a sense, was the grandfather of the New Deal later launched by his fifth cousin, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Finally, to a greater degree than any of his prede predecessors, T.R. opened the eyes of Americans to the fact that they shared- Ow! I just scratched my finger. To the fact that they shared the world with other nations. As a great power, they had fallen heir to responsibilities and had been seized by ambitions, from which there was no escaping. Right, yes, this horrendous heading. <laughs> a taft, a round bag in a square hole. William Towered Taft, with his ruddy complexion and upturned mustache, at first inspired widespread confidence. Everybody loves a fat man, the saying goes, and the jovial Taft, with mirthquakes of laughter bubbling up from his abundant abdomen, was personally popular. He graduated second in his class at Yale and has established an enviable reputation as a lawyer and judge, though he was widely regarded as a hostile as hostile to labor unions. He had been a trusted administrator under Roosevelt in the Philippines, at home, and in Cuba, where he had served capably as a troubleshooter. But good old Will suffered from legal political handicaps. Roosevelt had led the conflicting elements oh, where did it? Um, what, conflicting elements sorry, of the Republican Party by the sheer force of his personality. Taft, in contrast, had none of the arts of a dashing political leader and none of Roosevelt's zest for the fray. Recoiling from the clamor of controversy, he generally adopted an attitude of passivity towards Congress. He was a poor judge of public opinion, and his candor made him a chronic victim of foot and mouth disease. Peaceful Bill was no doubt a mild progressive, but at heart he was more wedded to the status quo than to change. Significantly, his cabinet did not contain a single representative of the party's insurgent wing, which was on fire for reform of current abuses, especially the tariff. The dollar goes abroad as a diplomat. Though ordinarily a subject, Taft bestirred himself to use the lever of American investments to boost Amer American political interests abroad, an approach to foreign policy that his critics denounced as dollar diplomacy. Washington warmly encouraged Wall Street blankers to slice solicit their surplus dollars into foreign areas of strategic concern to the United States, especially in the Far East and in the regions of critical to the security of and regions critical to the security of the Panama Canal. By preempting investors from rival powers such as Germany, New York bankers thus strengthened American defense for foreign policies while bringing further prosperity to their homeland and to themselves. The almighty dollar thereby supplanted the big stick. China's Manchuria was the object of Taft's most spectacular effort to inject the reluctant dollar into the Far Eastern theater. Newly ambitious Japan and imperialistic Russia, recent foes, controlled the railroads of this strategic province. President Taft saw in the Manchurian railroad monopoly a possible strangulation of Chinese economic interests and a consequent slamming of the open door in the faces of the U.S. merchants. In 1909, Secretary of State Freelander and C. Knotts blunderingly proposed that a group of American and foreign bankers buy the Manchurian railroads and then turn them over to China under a self-liquidating arrangement. Both Japan and Russia, unwilling to be jock-eyed out of their dominant position, bluntly rejected Knox's overtures. Taft was showered with ridicule. Another dangerous now new trouble spot was the Revolution Riddle Caribbean, now virtually a Yankee link. Hoping to head off trouble, Washington urged Wall Street bankers to pump dollars into the financial vacuums in the Honduras and Haiti to keep out foreign funds. The United States, under the Monroe Doctrine, would not permit foreign nations to intervene, and consequently felt obligated to put its money where its mouth was to prevent economic and political instability. So much more than this page. Again, necessity was the mother of armed Caribbean intervention. Sporadic disorders in palm fronted Cuba, Honduras, and the Dominican Republic fought American forces in these countries to restore order and protect American investment. A revolutionary upheaval in Nicaragua, partly fomented, fomented by American interest, resulted in the landing of 2,500 Marines in 1912. The remains, the remains. 
the Marines remained in Nicaragua for 13 years. Taft the Trust Buster. Taft managed to gain some fame as a smasher of monopolies. The ironic truth is that the colorist Taft brought 90 suits against the Trust during his four years in office, as compared with some 44 for Roosevelt in seven and a half years. By fateful happenstance, the most sensational judicial actions during Taft's regime came in 1911. In that year, the Supreme Court ordered the dissolution of the mighty Standard Oil Company, which was judged to be a combination and restraint of trade in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. <laughs> At the same time, the court handed down its most famous rule of reason. This doctrine held that only the combinations of unreasonably restrained trade were illegal. This fine print prov proviso ripped a large, a huge hole in the government's antitrust net. Even more explosively, in 1911, Taft decided to press the an antitrust suit against the U.S. Steel Corporation. This initiative infuriated Roosevelt, who had personally been involved in one of the mergers that prompted the suit. Once Roosevelt's protege, President Taft, was increasingly taking on the role of his antagonist. The stage was being set for a bruising confrontation. Taft splits the Republican Party. Okay. Lowering the barriers of the formidable protective tariff, the mother of trust, was high on the agenda of the progressive members of the Republican Party, and they at first thought they had a friend and ally in Taft. True to his campaign promises to reduce tariffs, Taft called Congress into special session in March 1909. The House proceeded to pass a moderately reductive bill, but senatorial re reactionaries tacked on hundreds of upwards tariff provisions. Only to items such as hide, sea moss, and canary seed were left on the duty-free list. Much to the dismay of his supporters, Taft signed the Payne Aldrich Bill, sub rubbing salt in their wounds by proclaiming it was the best bill that the Republican Party had ever passed. Taft revealed a further knack for shooting himself in the foot in his handling of conservation. The portly president was a dedicated conservationist, and his con contributions, like the establishment of the Bureau of Mines to control mineral resources, actually equally surpassed those of Lo Roosevelt. But his praiseworthy accomplishments were largely erased from the public mind by the noisy belinger pinot quarrel that erupted in 1910. When Secretary of the Interior Richard Ballinger, B Ballinger opened public la lands in Wyoming, Montana, and Alaska to corporate development, he was sharply criticized by Gifford Pinot, Chief of Agriculture Department's Division of Forestry and Stalwart Rooseveltian. When Taft dismissed Pinot on the narrow grounds of insubordination, a storm of protest arose from the conservationists and from Roosevelt's friends, who were legion. The whole unsavory episode further widened the growing rift between the president and the former president, one-time Boston political partners. The reformist wing of the Republican Party was now up in arms, while Taft was being pushed increasingly into the embrace of the stand pat old guard. By the spring of 1910, the grand old party was split wide open, owing largely to the clumsiness of Taft. A suspicious Roosevelt returned triumphantly to New York in June 1910, and shortly thereafter stirred up a tempest. Unable to keep silent, he took to the stump at Os Osawatomi, Kansas, and shocked the old guard with a flaming speech. The doctrine that he proclaimed, popularly known as the New Nationalism, urged the national government to increase its power to, rem to remedy economic and social abuses. Weakened by these internal divisions, the Republicans lost badly in the congressional election in 1910. In a victory of landslide proportions, the Democrats emerged with 228 seats, leaving the once dominant Republicans with only 161. In a further symptom of the reforming temper of the times, a socialist representative, Austrian born Victor L. Berger, was elected from Bill Lockey. The Republicans, by virtue of holdovers, retained the Senate 51 to 41, but the, four in but the insurgents in their midst were num numerous enough to make that hold precarious. All right. Um, the sputtering, the Taft Roosevelt rupture. The sputtering uprising in Republican ranks had now blossomed into a full-fledged revolt. Early in 1911, the National Progressive Republican League was formed, with the fiery white man Senator Lafayette of Wisconsin its leading candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. The assumption was that Roosevelt, an anti-third termer, would not permit himself to be drafted. But the restless Rough Rider began to change his views about third terms as he saw Taft, hand in glove, with the hated old guard, discard my policy. In February 1912, Roosevelt formally wrote to seven state governors that he was willing to accept the Republican nomination. His reasoning was that the third term tradition applied to the three conservative consecutive elective terms. Exuberantly, he cried, My hat is in the ring, and the fight is on, and I am stripped to the buff. Roosevelt forthwith seized the progressive banner, while Lafayette, who had served as convenient pathbreaker, was protestingly elbowed aside. Girded for battle, the Rough Rider came clattering into the presidential primaries, then being held in many states. He shouted through half clenched teeth that the president had fallen under the thumb of the reactionary bosses, and that although Taft means well, he means well feebly. The once genial Taft, now in a fighting, fighting mood, retorted by branding Roosevelt supporters emotionless and neurotic. The Taft Roosevelt explosion war was was near in June 1912, when the Republican Convention met in Chicago. The Rooseveltites, who were about 100 delegates short of winning the nomination, challenged the right of some 250 Taft delegates to be seated. Most of these contests were arbitrarily settled in favor of Taft, whose supporters held the throttle of the convention steamroller. The Roosevelt's adherents, crying fraud and naked theft, in the end refused to vote, and Taft triumphed. Roosevelt, the supposedly good sportsman, refused to quit the game. Having tasted for the first time the bitter cup of defeat, he was now on fire to lead a third-party crusade. Oh, okay. 
Uh, this is the last heading. Cool. The Bull Moose Campaign of 1912. Office hungry Democrats, the out since 1897, were jubilant over the disruptive Republican brawl at the convention in Chicago. If they could come up with an outstanding reformist leader, they had an excellent chance to win the White House. Such a leader appeared in Dr. Woodrow Wilson, once a mild conservative but now a militant progressive. Beginning professional life as a brilliant academic lecturer on government, he had risen in 1902 to the presidency of Princeton University, where he had achieved some sweeping educational reforms. Wilson entered politics in 1910 when New Jersey bosses, needing a respectable front candidate for the governorship, offered him the nomination. They were expected to lead the academic novice by the nose, but to their surprise, Wilson waged a passionate reform campaign in which he assailed the predatory trust and promised to return state government to the people. Riding the crest of progressive wave, the schoolmaster in politics was swept into office. Once in the governor's chair, Wilson drove through, drove through the rental state as chief of old forward-looking measures that made a reactionary New Jersey one of the more liberal states, and its zealous chief executive a leading contender for the presidency. When the Democrats met at Baltimore in 1912, Wilson was nominated on the 46th ballot, aided, to the, aided by William Jennings Bryan's switch to his side. The Democrats gave Wilson a strong progressive platform to run on, dubbed the New Freedom Program. So, Surging events had meanwhile been thrusting Roosevelt to the floor as a candidate for presidency on a third-party progressive Republican t- ticket. The fighting ex-cowboy, angered by his recent rebuff, was eager to lead the charge. A pro-Roosevelt progressive convention assembled in Chicago in August 1912. Dramatically symbolizing the rising political status of women, as well as progressive support for the cause of social justice, Settlement House pioneer Jane Addams placed Roosevelt's name in nomination for the presidency. Thunderous applause erupted when Roosevelt declared, We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. William Allen White, the caustic Kansas journalist, later wrote, Roosevelt bit me and I went mad. Roosevelt boasted that he felt as strong as a bull moose, and the bull moose took its place with the donkey and the elephant in the American political zoo. As one poet whimsically put it, I want to be a bull moose, and with the bull moose stand with antlers on my forehead and a big stick in my hand. With the overshadowing question of the 1912 campaign was which of two varieties of progressivism would prevail, Roosevelt's new nationalism or Wilson's new freedom. Both men favored a more active government role in economic and social affairs, but they disagreed sharply over specific strategies. Roosevelt preached the theory spun out by the progressive thinker Herbert Crowley in his book The Promise of American Life. Crowley and T.R. both favored continued consolidation of trust in labor unions, paralleled by the growth of powerful regulatory agencies in Washington. Roosevelt and his bull mooses also campaigned for women's suffrage in a broad program of social welfare, including minimum wage laws and publicly supported health care. Clearly, the Bullmoose progressives looked forward to the kind of comprehensive welfare state that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal would one day make a reality. Wilson's new freedom, by contrast, favored small enterprise, entrepreneurship, and the free functioning of unregulated and unmonopolized markets. The Democrats shunned social welfare proposals and pinned their economic faith on comp- competition, on the man, on the make, as Wilson put it. The new freedom program called for the banking reform and tariff reductions, but its keynote was not regulation, but fragmentation of the big industrial combines, chiefly by means of vigorous enforcement of the antitrust laws. The election of 1912 thus offered voters a choice not merely of policies, but of political and economic philosophies, a rarity in U.S. history. Former Professor Wilson won handily, with, with 435 electoral votes and 6 million popular votes, or 41% of the total. The third-party candidate, Roosevelt, finished second, receiving 88 electoral votes and 4 million popular votes. Taft won only 8 electoral votes and 3 million popular votes. To the impressive tally for both progressive candidates to be added some support for socialist candidates... <laughs> Sorry. Ah! To the impressive tally for both progressive candidates must be added some support for the socialist candidate, the persistent Eugene V. Debs, who wrote up 900k votes, 6% of the total cast. Starry-eyed socialists dreamed of being in the White House within eight years. Taft went on to, the fruit, went on to a fruitful old age. He taught law for eight pleasant years at Yale University and in 1921 became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a job for which he was far more happily suited than the presidency. <laughs> bah. Oh, my TV hurt. Okay, well, that was chapter 28. Cool map. Looking at the map. Okay, awesome.